So something, it was called like uh, something like the communist, uh, the Red Pentagon or something like that. Because it was clearly the left, you know, the, the eastward leaning forces, right? Clearly in an alliance, right, versus the others who, even the PD, which was kind of a moving towards social, more modern social democracy, still, you know, more westward leaning, versus these who were more like east, uh, let's still maintain relationships with Russia and all, all that. Okay, um, but there, and here's, here's the electoral map, and I, I left this because it's very telling, uh, but this is 1996, okay. Um, okay. Well, what happens between 1992 and 1996? Well, the, as we talked about this, there was a delayed transition. But delayed transition means simply that things don't get done. Mean, means that those reforms that have to be done are actually not done. Uh, and that includes economic reforms. And there's, otherwise, you know, changes happen, it's just slower. So people just suffer gradually, and there's no significant move. So obviously, um, movement. Obviously, uh, there will be some who will be winners of the transition, right? Just like in the other countries, but here even more so because of this control over the government by these, you know, non-democratic or less democratic forces, right? Um, uh, uh, you have uh, right ground for corruption, and that's exactly what will happen. So you will have the rise of local oligarchs and national oligarchs and so-called barons, they call them. Um, so these economic interests become intertwined with political interests and that will haunt that PSD, later Social Democratic Party, up for up until today. This, this, this intertwining of economic, political power and interest based on obviously mutual benefit, uh, this, this treatment of, of the country, of the state as, um, as, as your own, uh, you know, uh, uh, private property, which is called patrimonialism, right? This patrimonial, clientelism, patrimonialism, all of these will be characteristics of, of, of this regime. So, the point, the point is that some will benefit from this. And part of the reluctance was, again, because, first of all, politically, culturally, they weren't able to think in terms of radical change. These were not truly reformed social democrats, unlike in the other countries, right? They were more retrograde, kind of communism with a human face kind of people, or beneficiaries of transition, you know, corrupt and so on. That's a very nice <laughs> union here. And over it all uh, was enthroned Yonides, who was a president, who kind of, you know, he always maintained this image and uh, factual, uh, you know, reality that, you know, he was never got to reach out of it, or, you know, so he's, he's poor and honest, he always said. Yeah, but he also presided over this whole, uh, you know, uh, uh, network of, of, of stagnation, corruption, incompetence, and slow movement towards we don't know where. So obviously, the large majority of the population, including those who have been voting for the, uh, for the, for the front, or let's call it PSD, they will be losers, and especially the blue color, especially the older people. And even if many of them will remain voters, many of them would now, after six years, will turn, will turn against them. Right? And that's what happens in 96. Finally, the opposition, the, opposition, the anti-communist opposition, the westward leaning brand, great coalition, manages to win the election also by being better organized, but simply by appealing to more people. There has been a change in political culture, including among those who perhaps were not as readily westward leaning as, as uh, before, at, at the beginning of the 1990s, you know, blue, more blue collar workers. They have been enlightened, so to speak. <laughs> um, so the, what happens is that the presidency is won by the candidate of the Democratic Convention, which is this broad alliance of anti you know, Iliescu, anti com they call themselves anti-communist, anti-front, anti-PSD uh, coalition. Um, and uh, notice that not in the first round, but in the second round, right, with the help of all the others, you also have running the Democratic Party with the former Prime Minister Pedro Roman. Uh, you also have separate candidates from the Democratic Union of Hungarians and Romania. And you're going to ask, why would the ethnic Hungarian party run a candidate, clearly they don't think they will obtain a majority. It was actually a, a very strange coup, an image coup for them, because it was a very presentable, very very well, um, uh, a candidate 
so it's, a, it's a very, very good image. And he actually, you know, parties run presidential candidates in some presidential systems, not necessarily because they will win, but because they elevate the profile of the party. There's nothing that presents a party better than a candidate. When it's many, people don't get the message. When it's one and a good one, they get the message, right? So that's what they did, and it was very, very successful. Okay, and you have Greater Romania Party, a radical extremist party, another extremist party running their own, and so on. In the, so here's the map, because this is so telling, what I was telling you about, right? So here is the first round of elections for the uh, president. Blue is the Democratic Convention, red is the, uh, you know, front, the, the Iliescu's party, right? There it is. It's right there. It's, and green is the Hungarian candidate. So it, it shows you so, much, uh, so clearly the, the, the cleavages that I was telling about, about West running, East running. Also, you know, there's some combinations, you know, uh, for example, clearly you see Bucharest, which is here, is actually, you know, West running and so on. So those cleavages that I told you about and those categories, and which I detail in, in that paper, uh, are, are so powerfully, uh, poignantly described here. In the second round, all the Hungarian votes go for the Democratic Convention candidate, of course, and there, that's, the, that's the result in the second round. It's uh, very, uh, very <laughs> even more so than anywhere else. Uh, this candidate got more in the Hungarian region because all of them voted for the Democratic Convention than in any other region. So it's very, except for, uh, uh, probably except for this, or almost. Okay. So, uh, you see it. Transylvania, except for this, where the miners are, by the way. <coughs> Moldova and Balak. Yeah. Um, okay, in the parliament, uh, the Democratic Convention gets the most votes with 30%, not a majority, so it will enter into a coalition government with a kind of social democrats, former, former splinter from the front party, the Democratic Party, and with the Democratic Alliance of Hungarians and Romania. That would be a huge, huge watershed moment. We talked about the other cleavage, the pro versus against ethnic Hungarians, right? And this will be in a, in a decade where the Hungarian threat was, was used as a, as a sort of a political tool. Right, in which you know threatening, especially for those in those regions where there are no Hungarians, because that's where it works well. Um, to be able to include the Hungarian uh, party in the government. And actually, as it turns out, for them to be one of the most competent, or at least trustworthy, or at least serious members in the government, will change the political culture in Romania. You see how important it is, this solution to multi ethnic societies, this idea of representation. That once it becomes part, of, as I was telling you in the previous election, the only solution to conflict, and there had been street conflict, right, remember, is politics. Politics to representation. Because conflict is inevitable in terms of, it doesn't have to be violent, but disagreeing is part of human society. Any two people would get together and disagree. The point is, where do we solve this disagreement that is natural in any human society, and transform, how do we transform it into common collective action? That is the conundrum of politics. That is what politics responds to. Especially democratic politics. Here's a, here's a, here it is in action. And notice that this is 96. At this point, the wars in Yugoslavia, which is the southern neighbor of Romania, are raging. And that, it's not by chance that this also happens, and there, because they saw what can happen. Or, you know, in, a, in, a, in an ethnic society that doesn't manage to, to solve its, um, what ethnic society doesn't manage to solve its real or imagined conflicts, because these conflicts aren't real, right? Of course. They have been operationalized by interested elites or also tapping into nationalism of regular people. Okay, I think nationalism of regular people, it's, it's a vice of, it's, it's a two-way street here, right? Notice that when the language of the elites change, changes, the very conflict disappears. So if it, if it would be a real conflict, then it wouldn't, well, if not disappear, but it wouldn't go away so easily. This, this, would, this, this is a very, uh, interesting aspect of, of our study of Central Eastern Europe because you see multi-ethnic societies taking so many streets. In Yugoslavia, because of specific reasons, war, war and violent secession, 
in Czechoslovakia, peaceful secession, right, or peaceful at least, you know, change, uh, changing in statehood, here you have a solution through representation. Uh, because, and, and, and that, has, that has worked. Once it was accepted as a regular, as a legitimate player, and because they have delivered, because they were a good political player, who actually were competent, perhaps more competent than the others in the eyes of many in the population. Okay? Later their image also will change, but we'll talk about that. Okay, so Chamber of Deputies is the same situation, because of course they elected at the same time with the same method. But, so you're going to say, well, victory! We have regime change, finally, in the, in the, in the true sense, meaning that election, the communists were swiped, swept away, you have the opposition. Well, remember what happened to the opposition in every single other Central European country after the first election that they won so greatly. They fell apart, and that's exactly what will happen here, nothing else. First of all, they will, be, they will turn out to be fragmented, fractures, they could not agree. Those delayed transitions were, were posing a big conundrum or, 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 or question mark of, of, of the need, referring to the need to endeavor some radical reforms now, now. But radical reforms hurt. And this fragmented coalition didn't have the unity of action, neither the, nor, nor the strong leader. Because the elected president, Emil Constantinescu, was a university professor, very nice and everything, and good intention, but not a strong president. And you need a strong, unifying leader of some sort to push in a, in a certain direction, and the natural position for that is the president. Inescu was that, in his own direction, but he was a strong president. None of his prime ministers had anything to say when whoever wanted to comment something, remember he brought in the minors once. <laughs> I mean, Constantinescu was so constitutionally minded, so democratic, that he couldn't use the tools of politics to push in the right direction. In fact, at the end of his mandate, shamefully, according to, for many, uh, Emil Constantinescu, this president who was elected on the hopes, really on the hopes of, of the entire country, on a, a euphoric election to oust the ex-communists, he will, four years later, he will appear on TV to say that I have been defeated. Now that is not something that any country wants to hear from its president, who is supposed to lead. Uh, in the US, Jimmy Carter talked about, uh, I don't know, malaise and so on, and it has never left that, the stamp of talking about that has never left him up to this day. Now, so it, it is not something you do. As a president, to say that you have been defeated by, he says, the forces of, you know, the former secret police who are now the economic uh, gray underground, whatever, it's not allowed to say such Okay, uh, well, so the, the government will be a failure. It will fragment, different parties will leave the government, uh, so it will be a complete and utter disaster. And remember, the more the hopes were, the higher the hopes, uh, the worse the fall. The worse the fall. And it will be a disastrous fall. A disastrous fall. Just like in other countries where the first party that wins the election and will fail to deliver, that heightened expectation will disappear so here, so here. So in 2000, you have, yes, you have guessed, the return of the now called social democrats with, with Ioni Lescu. With Ioni Lescu, because that, he was the most prominent member of his party, he, they proposed him for president, well, he was a candidate. Um, so they return, um, and uh, the, some of the parties that had been part of the Democratic Coalition simply disappeared, never to be heard of, really, almost like the Peasant Party, which was one of the major parties in the 90s. That historical party will be crushed by, by their failure uh, to, to, to govern. Other parties will, will manage to survive and, and change, you know, perhaps because they left the government earlier or whatever. Uh, so here it is uh, the president, Yoni Lescu. Uh, but notice who gets the second vote. Not democratic opposition, because it was just crushed by its incompetent governance. Uh, one of the candidates, one of those parties gets 11%, whatever, and independence run, and so on. The second one is the leader of this extremist, xenophobic, anti, whatever you want. And also one of the former, he was one of the court poets of Ceausescu, literally. He wrote poetry to glorify the leader, the communist. And, you know, was associated with the secret police during communism. And all of these guys, who were both communists and nationalists back, back then, fiercely anti-Hungarian nationalists and anti-whatever, anti-West, anti-name it, 
they will become nationalist and sort of nostalgic communists and nationalists after 1990, and he is the best exemplar of that. And you see, this is a sort of an anti-system, anti-everything party, uh, based on a fierce rhetoric of you know nationalism and you know hatred basically. And in the times of crisis, when the democratic opposition fails and we have to elect again the same old, these people, you know, after 10 years of failed transition in a way, these people get votes. And he will get 28%, only 8% less than Eliescu in the first round, but not in the second. Notice that in the second round you will actually uh, get, he will get 66%, he will crush. Uh, uh, his, his rival. Why? Because everybody went to vote, even those who hated the Unilis, who from, hated his guts, they went to vote to oust, to, to make sure that this, this extremist doesn't get, get to power. They're going to say, well, this is weird and strange for Romania and whatever, but it's not, because it, it's at the same time, the same thing is taking place actually in France. There were an extremist, uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen, will get into the second round, with the, with the, what was it, Jacques Chirac, yeah? And the same thing happens in France around the same time. So, actually, you know, or two years later, the same thing. So, you know, this is not a strange phenomenon. The rise of nationalistic or xenophobic or extremist parties in, 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 in Europe that happened, has been happening since the, since the 80s, but it's predicated on a democratic fatigue uh, and, uh, you know, sort of a failure of, of a tiredness with the existing status quo elites. But what happens after the 2000 elections is so, is so interesting. Let's look at the election for the parliament, right? Still under PR and whatever. Notice the, or, or chamber of death, this doesn't matter. Um, you have the PSD getting 37% of the, of the votes, you know, 65 seats. <coughs> but out of 140, that's not a majority. So they don't have a majority. Now, Remember that previously, in the previous mandate, they have allied themselves with the Great Romanian Party, with extremists. They can't do that anymore because, first of all, they have become, now, they have become a social democratic party. So, the communists were first, or ex-communist second ranking, first became a sort of a reform communist, stagnating, eastward looking, whatever, in the 90s, plus allied with oligarchs and whatever. And so, uh, later, it takes them 10 years to actually become reformed, Communist Social Democrats, uh, as their counterparts have done in all the Central European countries in 1989 and 1990. Social Democrats in Hungary, in Poland, and whatever, they did that in 1990. It took them 10 years. You see the delayed transition to become that. Just like it took them six years to actually do that watershed election, not in 1990 but 1996, it would take them 10 years to become the Reform Social Democrats. But still allied with those oligarchs and corrupt and you know, they have been installed in, the, in power. Uh, they will not form a coalition with the Greater Romania Party because now they're social democrats. Now they're, you know, they, everybody's pushing now towards NATO and EU and whatever, finally. Uh, I mean, all the rest were, but now the social democrats also know that this is the direction. Um, but also because the leader of the Greater Romanian Party, this fiery personality, has been viciously attacking Ion Iliescu, the leader of the Social Democrats, during the presidential election, actually between the two rounds. So he attacked him so brutally that any possible bridge between these parties was broken. That's very important. Uh, then you have the Democrats, kind of Social Democrats, uh, Social Democratic orientation. Then you have the National Liberal Party, more center-right. Notice that the Romanian Democratic Convention doesn't even make it into the center doesn't even make it into the Senate, because as an alliance it needed some 8 or 10 percent. The other extremist party disappears because this one becomes the big extremist party because of his, its very loud leader. And you have the Hungarian um, party. But notice that what I highlighted here. Indeed, the Social Democrats will form a minority government with the support of the Hungarian that's tremendous. After in the 90s, where the Social Democrats, well, former front of the ES, were part of the same nationalistic rhetoric, if not as awful blood, uh, like Greater Romania party. And now they form a government, and that shows you that they have grown up, that the political elite has grown up. 
And the fact that the Hungarian party has demonstrated its you know, seriousness, competence, whatever it is, while it was in government. Of course, they will be accused, and this will, you know, it will, they will carry a certain stigma because of this. Because they will say, wait a minute, it seems that you are able to be in power with anyone. Aren't you actually only about power and benefits? And, you know, the response to that is that because its, it's platform, its program is so clear, we want certain rights, self-governance, cultural rights for the Hungarian minority, uh, decentralization and whatever. Any, they can enter into a coalition with any other party, as long as they get part of their platform. And that is always the situation with the third parties, that are not a large party. They can always enter into a coalition as long as their ideology is clear and they know what they're looking for and they get that in the, in the governing platform. On, that's one, on the one hand. On the other hand, it's true that they, many of these, these politicians will also be affected by the lure of power and benefits that come from that. Okay, so that's the 2000 um, situation. But you see, it is a watershed. Uh, it is a watershed in 2000 um, because suddenly the cleavage has changed. And that's the point I make in that article, the paper as well, that the cleavages have changed. Uh, because you had the eastward versus westward looking cleavage. Well, with the transformation, with, while being in opposition, and the transformation of the front into a sort of a social democratic party, still corrupt and allied with oligarchs and whatever, um, that kind of got, you know, the choice of east went away. Plus, you know, Ilias was kind of slowly, he was elected president, but it was time for a new generation. These were people who have benefited from the transition. They were no interest of going to some whatever past or whatever. They wanted to go into the future because the future meant they, got, they were getting rich. Um, and so that eastward westward was kind of much a tenu uh, change. Change, or if not, it didn't go away, it did change significantly because the westward direction. Uh, in a few years, Romania will become a member of NATO, 2004, 2007, European Union. That direction was very clear. And so everybody was set on this direction except for some fringe extremist parties. Even those didn't say against it. But, you know, they were a little bit more reluctant. Maybe. Okay, um, so that's, another, that's one cleavage. The other cleavage of the pro-against ethnic Hungarians, that kind of got exploded when the DHR, uh, DHR uh, the ethnic Hungarian party became part of the government in 1996 and even more so now because they became part of a government became legitimate political actors in many ways representing the fact that the Hungarian, ethnic Hungarians are legitimate actors in the society in alliance with the party that has been on the other side of the cleavage right? because the front, the PSD of, of Iliescu used to be on the kind of anti-ethnic minority side of the cleavage. And now they formed a sort of a coalition government. Actually it was a minority government with support from the parliament from the Hungarian party. But what will happen next? From 2000 2004, will they govern well? Will they succeed? Well actually they will endeavor several necessary reforms in order to be able to go towards NATO and the European Union and whatever, but it will be characterized by corruption, by stagnation politically if not as much economically, uh, by enrichment of the leadership of the party, of the, of the social democrats, and, and by even, in, even more intensified control through subtle means, right, because again it's democracy, but through subtle means first of the, or not so subtle, first of the state media, but also kind of influencing other media outlets. How? How can you influence other media outlets if it's a democracy? Well, media outlets live less nowadays, newspapers, they don't live out of subscriptions, they live out of ads, right? Now, the government itself, because privatization hasn't really happened completely, it has many enterprises, and they buy ads. So, you give all kinds of huge contracts to these media organizations, TV stations and so on, popular TV stations, so much so that they become dependent on you. Uh, you, you are financing them, well, through contracts, right? It's all economics, right, and so on, market. But it's a very powerful tool to keep them under, under, line, under control, because Media outlets, TV stations, they, they cost a lot, they, 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 they work with a lot of costs, and it's hard to be in the black, okay, be in the black, uh, to have profit, that's what I mean, not in the red, right? Uh, uh, and, and 
Such government contracts is also a means of controlling. And we can just do just an example. Control of the judiciary, corruption, and so on. So that's the situation. So people lived this, this period of 2000-2004 under Ilyescu, which was, you know, as a president, still there and active, but with a very powerful prime minister, Adrian Stasi. Very powerful prime minister um, who was arrogant and all that, yeah, to boot. And in 2006, when you have the next, uh, uh, um, uh, 2004, sorry, when you have the next election, uh, this prime minister will run for president. Because again, that's the position that really covered. Ilyescu was out of its, his two mandates. So Adriano Sasso is arrogant, uh, you know, enriched, uh, who have, has enriched himself, who, who have governed over this, this sort of a very heavy government in the sense of, you know, corrupt and, uh, kind of stagnating and kind of benefiting their circles and kind of using the tools of the state. So all of this, right? Um, he runs for presidency. And kind of everybody thinks, oh, kind of the sensation is that he will win. He will win. But he won't. And that is a, it's going to be a huge blow and it's, a, it's going to be a very interesting election in which again, this semi-presidential, the, the, the tricks and Characteristics of the semi-presidential system will come into very powerful relief. Uh, you will see them. You will see how important it is that it's the same presidential system when we discuss the results of the 2004 elections, and we will do that uh, and the period up to today in the next part of the lecture.